On my way here, I stopped in Boston, where my son lives, and where I do some occasional consulting for the program of SIBO Studies. And my son asked me what kind of talk I was going to give, and I told him it was going to be a placebo talk. And he said, Dad, is it going to be a real placebo talk, or are you just going to pretend to speak and see if anyone hears you? <laughs> and I told him it was double blind, so I really didn't know. <laughs> You'll have to debrief me at the end and let me know which it was. Early uh, in February, actually, in, in 2008, an analysis of antidepressant medications that I did with some colleagues was published in the medical journal PLOS Medicine. I woke up that morning to find that our study had become the lead front page news in virtually all of the UK daily newspapers. Two years later, it was still making news, had a four-page cover story in Newsweek. And two years after that, this came on television. The medical community is at war, battling over the scientific research and writings of a psychologist named Irving Kirsch. The fight is about antidepressants and Kirsch's questioning of whether they work. Somehow, I had been transformed from a mild-mannered university professor <laughs> into a media-hyped superhero or supervillain, depending on whom you ask. So how did this all come about? And to tell you that story, I have to go back to 1998, where an earlier study of mine uh, was published on uh, antidepressant medication. And what I need to preface that with is the fact that when I began this study with my graduate student, Guy Saperstein, I really had no interest in antidepressants. I was seeing clients as a therapist. Sometimes they were depressed, and sometimes when they were very depressed, I referred them to uh, psychiatric colleagues to get prescriptions of antidepressants. I assumed they worked. Everyone knew they worked. I did, too. Um, but I was interested in the placebo effect. I've always been interested in the placebo effect. And I wondered, what was the placebo effect like in the treatment of depression? I've been doing research on placebos all of my academic life. You might say that I'm addicted to placebo research. I've tried to kick the habit. I even went to Placebos Anonymous. where the first step was to admit that I really didn't have a problem at all. <laughs> but it didn't work. I couldn't stop researching the placebo effect. And so I started talking with Guy Saperstein, and, and we were thinking, well, where can we find the placebo effect? You know, everybody, why, why not depression? After all, one of the core features of depression is hopelessness. And the promise of effective treatment ought to diminish hopelessness, increase a sense of hopefulness. And that means that it ought to be effective in the treatment of depression. Let's try and measure it. So we combed the literature. Now, it was not enough to look at the drug effect, I mean, the, the, the placebo effect, because, you know, if, you've, if you have a cold and I give you a placebo, and I measure how you're doing a week later, you will have gotten better, right? It's not a placebo effect. That's just the passage of time, natural history. So just as to measure the drug effect, you need to have a placebo control. To measure the placebo effect, you have to have a control for natural history. So to what would happen if you didn't get the placebo? And so we scoured the literature, and we were looking for, for um, trials, clinical studies, in which depressed patients had been randomized to either get a placebo or get no treatment at all, being placed, let's say, on a waiting list and getting treatment later. Now, as it turns out, the only place we could find data on depressed patients get, being given placebo was in drug trials. So that meant that we had the drug trial 
data, and when you have data, you analyze it. We an we're not particularly interested. We're interested in this comparison, placebo versus no treatment, but we also analyzed the drug data. And what we're looking here is a change pre to post in the drug condition, and you get a, a standardized mean difference, different outcome scales uh, of about 1.5. That's a big, healthy effect in, in uh, change, improvement in medical literature. And a nice, big placebo response, and very little improvement, much less improvement in the no treatment condition. So that means we do have a real placebo effect. So it turns out about 25% of the response to the active medication, you get anyway, even without doing anything. You get another 50% of it by giving an inert pill, a placebo. That's the placebo effect in the treatment of depression. Fine, great, that's what we were interested in, but now there's a surprise. That leaves only 25% of the response as a true drug, response, a true drug effect. And that seemed to both Guy and, and, and me to be too small for a treatment that had been heralded as constituting a revolution in the treatment of depression. Well, we published these data, called the article Listening to, placebo, to Prozac but Hearing Placebo, and uh, not surprisingly, it turned out to be very controversial. And one of the most serious criticisms was that our analysis was flawed, that it derived from a minuscule group of unrepresentative, inconsistently and erroneously selected articles. Whew. What are we going to do? Well, what we did was try to replicate our own meta-analysis. And we did that by, where are we going to find another data set that doesn't overlap ours and see if we can get similar results or, or not, we went to the FDA. And we used the Freedom of Information Act, and we got from them all of the data that the drug companies had sent to them in the process of getting approval for what at that time were the six most widely prescribed antidepressant medication. Now, the FDA data is very special. First of all, it's the basis for drug approval. If there are anything wrong, if there's anything wrong with these trials, then arguably the drugs shouldn't have been approved in the first place. Second, the FDA, FDA data files contains information on all, on all of what the FDA has deemed to be adequate and well-controlled studies. And the all turns out to be very important because, as it turns out, 40% of these trials had never been published. Why hadn't they been published? Well, if you look at the published trials, you'll find that three out of four of them show a significant benefit of drug versus placebo. If you look at the unpublished trials, that shrinks to 12%. Now we had the published trials and the unpublished trials. We put them all together. We did the same kind of analysis that we did before. And we get this nice, healthy response on average to get, being given the antidepressant drug and an even bigger response on placebo. Now it's the placebo response not the placebo effect, but we know that that counts for relatively little, the, the, the spontaneous remission, the natural history. The placebo response is now accounting for 82% of the response to the active drug. And now we have this all on one scale, the Hamilton rating scale for depression, rather than having to do effect sizes from all different scales, and that's handy because it's a known, widely used clinical scale, uh, scale. The FDA required that that be used as a primary outcome variable for bio, in all of the uh, uh, drug trials, drug approval trials. And the difference between drug and approval is less than two points on the Hamilton 
scale. Now, the Hamilton scale, can, you can have scores ranging from 0 to 53 points. You can get a six-point difference just by changes in sleep patterns with no changes in any other symptom of depression. That's a small difference. And you don't have to take my word for it, because there's an organization in England called the National Institute of Health and Clinical Excellence. The acronym is NICE, and they're a very nice organization. What they do is to set treatment guidelines for the National Health Service. And in revising their treatment guidelines, they have established a criteria for clinical significance for saying that a drug is not only statistically, but clinically better than a placebo, and that's a three-point difference on the Hamilton depression scale, or an effect size of 0.5. And as you see, that comes nowhere close. The actual difference comes nowhere close. Now, I should mention to you, you probably already know this, the difference between statistical and clinical significance. See, statistical significance has to do with it concerns whether an effect is real or not. Is it reliable? Would you get the same effect if you were to run the study over again? It doesn't tell you anything about the size of the effect. It doesn't tell you how important it would be in somebody's uh, life. Clinical significance doesn't have to do with whether it's real or not. It has to do with how large is it? Is it something that's likely to make a difference in somebody's quality of life? Let me give you an example. Imagine that a study on 500,000 people has shown that smiling increases life expectancy by, five, by 10 seconds. I can virtually guarantee you that with that size sample, that 10 second increase in life expectancy is probably going to be statistically significant. Well, we published this second meta-analysis in 2002, and the critics complained that the patients weren't depressed enough. You see, they said, sure, if you give antidepressants to mildly depressed patients or moderately depressed patients, what you're going to see is probably a placebo effect. There won't be much difference between the drug and effect and the placebo effect. But, you know, we see severely depressed patients. And in severely depressed patients, that's where you'll see that the drug really does make a difference. Well, OK, that's a plausible argument. What are we going to do now? Well, let's go back to our data. And let's see how severely depressed, on average, the patients were at baseline before being given drug or placebo. As it turned out, there was only one study on patients with moderate levels of depression, none in mild depression. One study, an early study of, of Prozac, early tr clinical trial of Prozac, showed absolutely no difference between drug and placebo. There weren't any studies of patients with severe depression. All of the rest of the studies were in patients with very severe depression, according to the categorization used by both the American Psychiatric Association and by NICE. We did find within very severe depression there was a relationship between drug placebo difference, that is effect size, and severity of depression. And at the very extreme, very extreme levels of depression, there was a small group of studies showing patients with scores of 28 or above on the Hamilton Depression Inventory show a benefit of antidepressants that, in fact, passes the criterion for clinical significance. It is clinically uh, significant, clinically important. What does that mean in terms of percentages of patients? How many patients are that severely depressed? Well. From the same uh, data set, we had 7% who were moderately depressed, 78% who were very severely depressed, and only 15% who were 
very severely depressed, but at the extreme end of it, going beyond 28%. They benefited. In this data set, that meant that about 85% did not show a clinically meaningful benefit as a function of taking the active drug. So we published that in 2008. And the critics said, the patients were too depressed. <laughs> what did they mean? Well, you see, look, you, we go back to this. We had data on patients who were moderately depressed, and we had patients on da data on patients who were very severely depressed, but we didn't have patients, data on patients who were just severely, not very severely or moderately depressed. I guess that the editors of Nature Review's drug discovery, which had made that criticism, I guess they were expecting the drug effect to look something like this. <laughs> I call that the Loch Ness Monster hypothesis. <laughs> so what could we do? Well, I guess we could do a third meta-analysis started with collecting new data all over again. We didn't have to do that thanks to some wonderful researchers at uh, UPenn who did their own meta-analysis on five clinical trials for which they had access to the raw data. So these are trials not part of the data set in our first meta-analysis, not part of the FDA data set, and unlike most meta-analyses where you just have summary scores, mean standard deviations, they had patient by patient data, and they had data with mildly depressed patients and moderately and severely and very severely. And what did they find? And then, and that's the criterion for clinical significance. And then at the very end, doesn't that look familiar? And what does that represent in terms of the distribution of patients? Well, now we're getting a clinically significant benefit in about 10% of the patients when you include some mildly and some severely depressed patients, meaning that 90% of the patients were not showing a benefit, a clinically meaningful benefit at all. And then there was the critic's last resort, which is a true believer uh, argument. David Nutt in the UK said, antidepressants work. Everybody knows they work. And another critic wrote, clinical practice plus millions of content patients can't be that wrong. Well, the history of medicine is replete with treatments that have worked for millions. <laughs> and that's why we don't depend on anecdotal evidence for making treatment decisions. We do clinical trials, and we look at the data. And if you look at the data, everybody gets the same results. Here's going to be now my uh, study with my colleagues, our studies, uh, NICE's studies, Turner in Canada, my two harshest critics, my harshest critics did two meta-analyses to show that we were wrong. The difference between drug and placebo is small, and even the FDA agrees. The data that we have shows that the drugs are effective. But what about the degree of effectiveness? I think we all agree that the, the changes that you see in the short-term trials, the difference between improvement in drug and placebo is rather small. I love the look on Leslie Stahl's <laughs> face <laughs> when the director of the FDA has that to say. We all agree the difference is small to not see it you have to hide your head in the sand like an ostrich or a drug company sales rep. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if you look at the short-term trials or you confine yourselves to looking at the long-term trials. And it doesn't matter whether you look at depression or you look at these same drugs for the treatment of anxiety disorders. The difference is small. And these are in trials 
that are biased towards finding drug effects. They are biased trials in a number of ways. First of all, they're all industry funded, and here's what we know about industry funded trials. If you look at trials that are sponsored by the manufacturer of the drug, three out of four of them show a significant a positive benefit, significant effect for drug versus placebo. Bob, significant uh, positive effect for their drug. If you look at independently sponsored trials, that shrinks to about 50%. And if you look at comparator trials sponsored by a competitor, that shrinks even more to 28%. And then they screen out placebo responders by using what's called a placebo run-in or washout period. Here's how that works. They recruit patients to the trial. For the first two weeks, everybody, this is true of all of the FDA trials, everybody is put on placebo. By the way, they're not told that. They're not told even that they might be put on. They're told they might be, but they're not told that they're definitely going to be put on placebo for the first two weeks. But that's uh, routinely done. Those who respond to placebo during the first two weeks are kicked out of the trial. So you get rid of placebo responders. Then you screen out other patients who are likely to, unlikely to show a drug placebo difference. You screen out the mildly and moderately depressed because ever since that trial of Prozac, we've known that that doesn't work, so the drug companies start doing them. Chronically depressed, previous non-responders, comorbid conditions, suicidal patients, all screened out. And because of that, and wondering about the representativeness of the results of clinical trials, a large group multi-center trial was started. The, it's called the STAR-D trial. It's the most, $35 million. It's the most expensive and largest clinical trial ever done. About 4,000 uh, patients were enrolled into this trial. And they relaxed all these exclusion cases. And they didn't allow volunteers. So usually you search for volunteers to clinical trials. You may have, if you're around Boston, I can tell you, you see advertisements on the, on the T, on the, on the subway there. Do you suffer from, you may be eligible for a clinical trial which will include treatment and monetary compensation. Well, that not, might not be a representative. So for the STAR-D trial, only referrals from physicians of people diagnosed with major depression, everyone who's diagnosed regardless of moderately depressed, severely depressed, chronically depressed, comorbid, whatever, are referred for the trial. This is going to be more representative. As it turns out, 78% of the patients who were in the STAR-D trial would have been excluded from a conventional clinical trial. Now, here are, we're going to need to compare the STAR-D results to something, what are we going to compare it to? Well, here are two kinds of clinical trials. Here's a conventional clinical trial controlled by placebo. And here are what are called comparative trials that have no placebo controls at all. What you'll notice, of course, immediately, is that the um, uh, drug response in comparative trials, where the patients know that they're getting an active drug is substantially higher than the response in a placebo control trials where they understand that there's a good chance they might get placebo. Um, in fact, that placebo effect, because that is a placebo effect, isn't it? The difference between getting a drug, knowing you're getting a drug, and getting the same drug, thinking you might be getting a placebo, that placebo effect is larger than the difference between um, drug and placebo in clinical trials. Now, what should we compare it to? Well, the STAR-D trial did not have any placebo controls. They wanted to make it as much like clinical practice as possible. So the appropriate comparison would be the comparator trials. Here's the improvement on the Hamilton Depression Inventory in the STAR-D trial. 
it's less than the improvement you get in placebo, on placebo in conventional clinical trials, but what you need to compare it to. Between a half and a third. Now, we still don't know how much of that improvement is a placebo effect, right? Because there are no placebo controls. But there's a lovely study, and I really like the design of this study for a couple reasons that you'll see in a minute. Uh, that was published in 2013 that give us some data that allow us to estimate what that might be, what might be, have been the placebo component of the response in the STAR-D trial. Barber and colleagues, they did a 16-week trial comparing sertraline uh, to placebo and to insight-oriented, brief insight-oriented psychotherapy. 16-week trial is very long for a, a drug trial. It happens to be the length of trial of, of the STAR-D trial. Patients, very much like the patients who would be excluded from conventional clinical trials, many of them economically disadvantaged, high level of comorbidity, chronically depressed. And here's the part I like best. Non-responders at week eight, people halfway through the trial, they didn't respond to sertraline. They were switched to venlafaxine. One drug doesn't work, you try another. Non-responders in the placebo group were switched to a different placebo. That's the part I love. <laughs> Here's what they got in the drug group. Here's what they got in the placebo group. Virtually no difference at all, and the same level of response that you're getting in the STAR-D trial, and certainly no drug effect. Now, you may remember this slide, the estimate from the FDA studies at what percentage of people in those studies um, do and do not get clinically meaningful benefit. But those studies exclude 78% of the patients. It only includes those that are eligible for a conventional clinical trial. So how many depressed patients benefit clinically from the chemicals and antidepressant drugs? Well, here are 100% of the patients. 78% of them show no clinically important benefit beyond the placebo response at all. That leaves 22%. Most of them show no clinically important benefit, leaving 3% of patients who show, from these data, a clinically important benefit of antidepressant drugs. And it doesn't matter which antidepressant you take. When we did our first meta-analysis back in 1998, Guy Safferstein and I, when we first saw those data, we assumed we must have done something wrong. Something is not right here. Everyone knows that antidepressants work. Maybe, maybe we made the mistake of including um, uh, drugs that were effective for depression as well as drugs that weren't effective for, for depression. If we had done that, maybe some antidepressants are better than others. And if we're including studies on ineffective drugs, that's going to lead us to underestimate the potential of antidepressants to uh, ameliorate depression and maybe overestimate the placebo component of it. So we went back to our data and we look at, looked at what drugs were the patients in these studies on. Some were on tricyclics. Some were on SSRIs, some were on other antidepressants, included MIO inhibitors and, and things like that. And we found there were some other drugs in there too. There were some studies that were looking at things like barbiturates and benzodiazepam and lithium for, not for unipolar uh, depression and thyroid medication for people without a thyroid disorder, unipolar depressed patients. And in case after case, three-quarters of the response to the drug was duplicated 
by placebo. It didn't matter whether it was a tricyclic, an SSRI, some other antidepressant, or even something that's not conventionally considered an antidepressant. And I have to tell you, at that time, when I first saw those data, I said, oh, that would make a nice slide for a presentation. <laughs> I thought it was a fluke, lucky coincidence. But I've seen this pattern now over and over again, and it's uncanny. Here are results from meta-analyses of head-to-head -head comparisons between, in this case, SSRI and other antidepressants, NDRI, tricyclic. So these are all comparator trials, no placebo controls, head-to-head -head comparisons, response rates. They're all the same. They're all the same. And there's yet another drug that we should take into account that I don't have up here, and that is TNF-10. How many of you have heard of TNF-10? Very few. TNF-10 is a drug that is, has been approved by French re regulators, and it is marketed in France and a number of other countries as an antidepressant. The most common antidepressants these days are SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. TNF-10 is an SSRE. It's a selective serotonin reuptake enhancer. It is supposed to do exactly the opposite chemically of what SSRIs are supposed to do. Instead of inhibiting the reuptake so that there's more serotonin available in the synapses, it's supposed to enhance reuptake so that there's less serotonin available in the synapses. Were there any truth to the serotonin theory of depression? And I don't know a responsible researcher in the area that still contends there is. Uh, it's only in marketing that you still see that talked about. Were there any truth to that? SSREs are, should not help people recover from depression. It ought to make them depressed. Here's what it does. In head-to-head -head trials against both SSRIs and mipramine and, and uh, tricyclics. So what do you call pills? the effects of which are independent of their chemical composition. <laughs> and they should be taken with a grain of salt. <laughs> well then, how should we treat depression? We might prescribe antidepressants for their placebo effect. After all, the patients are getting better. Many of them, a lot of people don't. I mean, the response rates around 50, 60 percent, as you saw. So it means about 40 to 50 percent uh, are not meeting the criterion for a clinically, clinical response, which is 50 percent uh, reduction in symptoms. Rather arbitrary criterion, but we won't go into that. The point is, the People take the drugs, they get better. The, that's not the problem. The problem is it's not the chemical in the drug that's making them better because if they get the placebo, they get better as well. So we want to help people. We can't give them placebo. After all, that would be unethical. Let's, let's give them the drug. The problem is that these may be pl largely placebos in the treatment of depression, in terms of proving depression, but they are active drugs, and they have effects. And so we have to look at the benefits versus the risks in making treatment decisions. And first of all, there's the side effects. Sexual dysfunction, weight gain, insomnia, diarrhea, nausea, that's in order of frequency. And you might be surprised because everyone, everyone I've ever pointed this out to, is surprised to see the rate of sexual dysfunction on SSRIs ranges from one antidepressant to another between 70 and 80 percent. In other words, three out of four people who are given SSRIs will show treatment 
emergent sexual dysfunction. And I have to show you the data because, again, people just don't, don't believe it. Here's the rate of sexual treatment emergent, means they didn't have the sexual dysfunction before being given the placebo. And here it is on SSRIs, one after SSRI after another. I don't know if anyone's ever tried to prescribe an antidepressant to you. A um, physician has tried to prescribe one to me for something totally unrelated to depression at all. It was because I was giving too many talks and was stressed out by the travel. I gave between uh, um, mid-October and mid-December 2012, I gave 14 talks in six countries. In the midst of that, I went to see a physician for a totally unrelated region, talking about what was going on a little bit in my life. Tell him about that. He said, that's too much. You need to uh, uh, cut back. I said, yes, I'm going. It's too late to back out of the rest of these talks. He said, yeah, I can see that. Well, how about in the meantime, if I give you some citalopram? He wasn't kidding. He didn't know my research. <laughs> Anyway, antidepressants for 30 to 50 percent of patients act like um, addictive drugs. They get withdrawal symptoms when they try to discontinue. And it's not just the patients who show the withdrawal syndrome, because if antidepressants, when antidepressants are taken by pregnant women, 30% of, should be a zero after that, three, sorry about that. 30% of the neonates, the children born to those uh, women, show neonatal abstinence syndrome. It's essentially withdrawal syndrome from the child of someone who was addicted to a drug during pregnancy. It's the same syndrome that's found on, from mothers who've been addicted to amphetamines, barbiturates, benzodiazepam, cocaine, and heroin. And then there are the health risks. Health risks of antidepressants include suicidal behavior in children and young adults up to the age of 24 in the FDA data, increased risk of stroke and death from all causes in the elderly, Increased risk of miscarriage, and if the mother does not miscarry, increased risks of birth defects, persistent pulmonary hypertension, autism, and withdrawal symptoms of the newborn. There's an increased risk of type 2 diabetes associated with um, antidepressant use, and this is the most surprising data of all of it, an increased risk of relapse surprises everyone again because the conventional wisdom is that taking antidepressants, if you continue taking them, will decrease the rate of relapse. You take it for a long enough time and you get better and you're not going to uh, relapse. And that claim is based on the following data. They do what are called, they have different names for it, they're called uh, um, withdrawal trials, uh, um, uh, relapse prevention trials, do a clinical trial, an efficacy trial like the data that we've been seeing. You take the people who respond positively to the antidepressant and you re-randomize them to either stay on the antidepressant or be switched to placebo. Those that stay on the antidepressant show a relapse rate 23 percent while they're still on the antidepressant. Those who are switched to placebo, you double the relapse. Goes up close to 50 percent. Well, that looks pretty good, but it leaves out one piece of important data. What happens to someone who gets better on placebo and is kept on placebo, as is done in continuation trials? And here's the answer. 
people don't relapse any more when they stay on placebo than they do when they stay on the active drug. But look at this difference. This difference is the increased rate of relapse that comes from the initial four to eight weeks of antidepressant treatment compared to just having been on placebo in the first place. And if that doesn't convince you, look at these data. This is from rat studies, rat brain studies, uh, plotted against treatment outcome studies, drug by drug. So what you have here is the percent of increase in serotonin in the rat's brain plotted against the degree to which that drug, the, the relapse rates that have been reported for that drug. And here it is for norepinephrine. And if that doesn't convince you, look at this study on exercise that was done, in which they recruited patients with major depressive disorder and randomized them into three groups. One group was randomized to receive an SSRI. I think, it, once again, that was citalopram, as I, uh, as I recall. Another given a structured physical exercise program. And the third group, they combined the two. Let's see if exercise plus SSRI is better than just SSRI alone. They're looking at a very stringent criteria, remission, not just response. Re what that means, response is a 50% reduction in, in symptoms. Um, remission, much more difficult to achieve. It means getting a Hamilton score of seven or below, with, which would put you in the not depressed category. Remission in four months of one of these three types of treatments. All the same, pretty good remission rates, actually. These are very good when you uh, remission rates. What happens after 10 months when patients can either continue or not continue doing their exercise, continue or not continue taking their antidepressants? Rate of relapse on uh, SSRIs, 38%. Rate of relapse on exercise, 8%. That's nice for exercise. But what happens if you put the two together? Adding an SSRI to the exercise program quadrupled the rate of relapse. Now, the question is, how, do, how does exercise work? There are a couple of hypotheses. I was speaking with Dr. Hagen about one of them earlier. I don't know it well enough to even try to explain it. Well, one possibility is that it might be an exercise. It might be a placebo. Let's assume for the moment that the beneficial effects of exercise on depression is a placebo effect. Well, now consider the side effects of antidepressants, sexual dysfunction, insomnia, weight gain, and compare them to the side effects of exercise. <laughs> Which placebo would you rather have? Well. If we can't prescribe antidepressants, even as active placebos, maybe we should prescribe placebos. And of course, there's a problem. The assumption is that in order for the placebo effect to occur, the person has to believe they're taking the active drug. And that means you have to either explicitly or implicitly deceive the patient. And deceiving the pa your patient is unethical. And by the way, I agree with that. Deceiving your patient, client, whatever you want to call it, whatever setting you are, I believe is unethical. The Germans believe there are some circumstances where it is ethical. I don't recommend it. I'll tell you one of the reasons I don't recommend it, aside from just the issue of personal autonomy. Uh, there's the fact that I think one of the potent uh, components of our ability to be effective clinicians is having the trust that our patients put in us, our clients put in us. And trust has to be earned. And if you violate it, you're going to lose it. So it's going to be self-defeating. So that's the conventional view. But is it right? Do you need to deceive patients in order to 
get a placebo effect. Well, my colleague Ted Kapchuk and I and the others at the program placebo studies wondered about that. Weren't so sure about it, and we decided to test it. Weren't able at that first time to test it in depression. So we tested it where we did have a, a lab we could work with in irritable bowel syndrome. And we put out an advertisement recruiting subjects to a, for a novel mind-body management study of IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. At the telephone screening, subjects were told, volunteers were told, that this study involved taking a placebo and an inert <coughs> pill, which is like a sugar pill. Got very few people who declined to come in after that. They came in and they all met with a physician and the physician explained that the placebo effect is powerful, that it's been shown to be effective in IBS, which is true from some of our previous studies, that the body can automatically respond to taking placebo pills to the very ritual of it, just the way Pavlov's dogs responded to a bell after being associated with meat powder. Actually, it was a buzzer, but everyone thinks it's a bell, so let's leave it that way. <coughs> and we told them that taking the pills was critical. Just, they didn't have to believe it, just have an open mind, take the pills, that's critical. Two pills twice a day, two pills two times a day. And then they were randomized to either be given the pills twice daily, two times, or placed in a wait list group where they continue to have same amount of treatment uh, by, this was actually a treatment as usual group, same amount of treatment by the, with the clinician but without the placebo pills. Here's what we got. No treatment, open label placebo. No treatment, open label placebo. And what I can tell you is that these response rates are about what you get with uh, most uh, um, treatments for IBS. My colleagues, John Kelly and Ted Kapchik and others at the program, and uh, Maurizio Fava, uh, who is a psychiatrist at, at Harvard and affiliated with our program, did a feasibility study. So take this one lightly because we only had 20 patients. We, we <laughs> go for a grant now to see if we can uh, expand on it. Four weeks on open label placebo, one group, on nothing, the other group, weightless, the other group, and then the other group was switched into the open label placebo group just to see whether it looked promising enough to do a more formal trial. Um, here's what we got two, four, and six weeks on open label placebo. These are moderately depressed patients. Here's what we got on, here's what you get on double blind placebo in the FDA trials in that length of time when you look at moderately depressed patients. That's that one Prozac trial, and here's what you get on Prozac over that. So it's at least promising, and I would not say, don't run out and say that's the answer for treating depression. I won't say that. I won't come close to saying that. It's just saying it's possible and worthy of further studies. So should we consider prescribing placebos openly? Well, there may be some problems. <laughs> but fortunately, we don't have to. Here are some data on a lot of different treatments for depression. Now, Here's what you get on antidepressants in terms of uh, um, mean symptom reduction, and here's what you get on uh, placebo. And so that's what you want to beat, is try and get how can we get that improvement over placebo. It's small, but we'd like to get it if we can. We want to certainly get the response, and we, at this point we still don't have a way of ethically uh, giving placebos for de to depressed patients. We can't just put them on a waiting list, very little symptom reduction. Psychotherapy works, as well as the drugs. If you add the two together, when the raters are blind, it does about the same thing, not much better than either one alone. Exercise does about the same thing. 
Acupuncture does about the same thing. Long-term results, if you've seen, are worse for antidepressants, better for psychotherapy and for exercise. Have no idea about acupuncture. So our guidelines for clinical, for treatment choice, ought to be that when treatments are equally effective, we should prescribe the safest. Safest is certainly not drugs. And when they're equally safe, which would exclude antidepressants, we should prescribe what patients prefer. And when you do surveys, including ones where you then give them the treatment they choose, three out of four patients prefer psychotherapy over drugs. Well, we don't have to prescribe anti uh, placebos, but I wish we could. As I pointed out, I just love placebos. I've been that's why I've been studying them all my life. And sometimes, I, I once had a dream. I, I dreamed that I woke up in the morning and I opened my favorite UK newspaper, The Dependent. And I read that placebo treatment had been approved by the FDA in doses ranging from 1 to 40,000 milligrams. <laughs> And then I thought, well, look, if, if we can prescribe placebos, we should be able to advertise it. And I wondered, what would a placebo advertisement look like? And I think it might look something like this. Prevaricane, a genuine placebo medication, tested in more clinical trials than any other treatment. So powerful, it's the standard by which all other medications are tested. <laughs> so effective, it's used in the treatment of thousands of ailments. It's safe enough to be given to infants, the elderly, and pregnant women. Remember, if it's a placebo, you can believe in it. <laughs> uh, about two hours ago, I met... Uh, Dr. Hagen of the School of uh, Veterinary Biology, and we were chatting, and the topic of Shakespeare came up. We looked at this uh, area outside of what place was that? Where it looked a little bit like an amphitheater that, may, that play might have been performed in. And uh, I thought maybe I would conclude by reading a poem of Shakespeare's. And then I thought, why should I? He never reads any of mine. <laughs> but still, the particular Shakespearean poem that I had in mind seemed so apropos that why not? So <clears throat> here goes. Need to wet my whistle first. Friends, colleagues, Missourians. Spare me your tears. I come to praise placebo, not to bury it. The evil doctors do lives after them. The good is oft in part placebo. The medical world's a stage, and placebo's merely players. Each one plays a different part. This one morphine, that one Prozac, and nothing is true but thinking makes it so. <laughs> Thank you. So we have time for discussion and questions and arguments and whatever. Yeah. This is depressing. <laughs> uh, I have just two questions. Out of curiosity, have you looked, you hear people say that they responded so well, uh, have you looked to see if there was an incident, a higher incidence of high responders in the treatment group, a small subset that differed from the placebo group? And the other question is, have you looked at anxiety? Yes. Looked at anxiety and the uh, the drug effect and anxiety is no larger than the drug effect 
in, of, of SSRIs in uh, depression. Uh, numerically, it's slightly smaller. I don't think it's significantly uh, uh, different. But, uh, so yes to that. When you look at response rates in double-blind trials, you usually get about a 50% response rate on active drug and about a 35 to 40 percent response rate in the placebo condition, which would suggest that there are 10 to 15 percent of patients who are responding to the drug who would not respond to the placebo. Before you run home with that, there are a couple things you have to take into account. First of all, you have to take into account what a response rate is especially in these trials. You see, the definition of response is about 50% improve, is exactly 50% improvement. So if you're improved by 50%, you're a responder. If you've improved by 49%, you're not a responder. You may recall from one of the other slides that the at mean response rate, and this does not seem bimodally, it seems more or less normally distributed, the mean response for, um, to antidepressant drugs is about a 50% improvement. Now, here's a couple problems. One, you are dichotomizing continuous variables. Statisticians will tell you correctly that it's a bad idea to dichotomize continuous variables. For one thing, when you're dichotomizing near the median, uh, you're potentially throwing away, discarding, it's equivalent to discarding about 30% uh, of the data. That's the first thing. But second thing is it takes someone who has shown a 50% reduction and makes it seem like they are very different than someone who is shown a 49% reduction, and that someone who's shown a 50% reduction is very similar to someone who's shown a 100% reduction, and someone who's shown a 49% is very similar to someone who's shown no improvement at all. Now, if you imagine the normal curve, 50% reduction in the middle, and think about the drug having an effect that's maybe two points, three points, on the scale that you're using as an outcome measure. What you're going to find is that you can get a small difference. If the drug has a very small effect, it will give you what seems like a large difference in response rates. That two-point difference is going to look like a 10, 15 percent difference in response rate, but it's made up of people not who went from being, would, they, wouldn't have been, they would be very depressed on placebo, but they're very, are very undepressed on drug. It's made up largely of people for whom that very small drug benefit pushes them over that 50% criterion. Is that making sense? So that's the next thing. That presumes, and that presumes that the difference between um, drug and placebo, small as it is, giving you about two points on the Hamilton scale, meaning about 10 percent difference in response rates, that that's due to the drug, the chemical, having a real effect on depression. It may not. It may not. And it may not because of the way clinical trials are done. So let's imagine. Imagine that you have been recruited to a clinical trial of uh, an antidepressant. You have, to be given you have to give informed consent. That means you have to be informed. The first thing they will tell you is this is a placebo-controlled trial. So you may be getting the active drug. You may get, be get, getting the placebo. It's double-blind. We won't tell you which until the end of the trial. The drug may take three, four weeks before you notice any real effect. That's what they say in antidepressant trials, because that's the lore not necessarily a fact, but it's the lore. Um, the active drug has been shown to have some, some side effects, and they include uh, dry mouth, constipation. There's a possibility of sexual dysfunction. You agree to the trial. 
Now, if I was a patient in that situation, I would wonder, what have I been given? Which group am I in? Am I getting the active drug? Am I getting the placebo? I don't know. The doctor tell me until the end of the trial. Gee, my mouth's getting dry. My mouth's getting dry. That's one of the side effects I mentioned. That means I'm in the drug group. I'm in the drug group. I'm not in the placebo group. I feel better already. <laughs> Here's what we know. 89% of patients in the drug group in clinical antidepressant trials will tell you they're in the drug group. That ought to be 50% by chance, right? You want to know what the P level is for that? I don't know if I have enough room for the zeros. I have, don't remember the exact number. A large number of zeros. We know from data that you've already seen that knowing you're getting the drug gives you a much better effect than thinking you might be getting the drug. Do you remember those data from that slide, the comparator trials versus the placebo controls, pl controlled trials? It's larger than the difference than be between drug and placebo in the placebo controlled trials. So I was once shown a cartoon years back. I'm so sorry I didn't scan it or do it. Maybe we didn't have scanners back then. It had two panels, and one panel was a guy walking down the street like this, and the label under it was placebo. And the other panel had a guy skipping with a big grin on his face, and it said active placebo, super strength placebo. <laughs> um, what you may be getting is not an effect, you're getting a drug effect, but it not be, might not be directly producing your doing anything to your depression, you might be getting a super strength placebo. You might be getting an enhanced placebo effect because you now know, based on the side effects that uh, you're experiencing, that you're in the drug condition and you no longer have that uncertainty, maybe I'm on a placebo. Yeah? I was just wondering to the extent that placebo effects could be a cultural phenomenon. So if you were to do these studies in you know, regions where medicines are not the common way of treating things, or the concept of a placebo is not as well known as it is, it appears a lot of these studies are in Europe and in North America. Would you find similar effects in those types of studies? Well, I'll, I'll give you two answers to that. One is, I don't think it's the placebo that's the cultural part of it. I think it's the belief in the active drug that's cultural. So if you believe in conventional medications, you're more likely to get a placebo effect uh, from drugs. If you believe in alternative med medicine, you're more likely to get a placebo effect from alternative uh, uh, treatments. And then you, if you believe in spiritual healing, you're more likely to get a placebo effect that lords or, uh, uh, from a, uh, a healer. And that's one thing. The other thing is you can get a placebo effect in infants, in people with congenital developmental disorders, um, and in animals, in pets. I was talking about that earlier. And that's called, the way that usually happens, so these, these are beings that don't even know they're getting a treatment. How can you get a placebo effect? Well, their carer knows they're getting a treatment. And you have a phenomenon called placebo by proxy. And placebo by proxy can work in two different ways. And one way is uh, how you, 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 you can't ask the dog if it's feeling better. You can't ask the baby if she's feeling better. You ask the parent, the pet owner, so you might be affecting the perception of the clinician, the parent, the pet owner, the carer. But you might be getting some objective differences at all. And there are data showing objective placebo effects. And the way that works is if the carer, the clinician, and so on, 
is expecting improvement, that might affect their behavior towards the, the I'll say subject, because we're talking even about animals here. And they may not even be aware of how their behavior is being affected, but their changes in behavior could affect, be affecting the behavior of the infant or the, uh, or the, or the animal. Okay, first, I'll, let me uh, address the second one first. I won't say anything about bipolar disorder, and I won't say anything about bi bipolar disorder because I haven't examined the data closely enough to be able to say anything. I used to have to say that about uh, when people ask me the question about, well, what about SSRIs and the treatment of anxiety? I even peaked at the data then more than I have for bipolar, but I hadn't done the careful analysis. Um, after one of my talks at Wayne University, uh, a, a graduate student and faculty member there said, well, let's do it. And I said, yes, let's do it. And we were just getting ready uh, to to submit the revision of that, uh, uh, resubmit a revision of those data. And so now I'm, it's absolutely clear to me that for anxiety disorders, the answer is the same. For bipolar, I really have no idea. I don't know, and I can't uh, answer that for that reason. Be irresponsible of me to do so. Um, if you mean, t you can, when you say talk yourself out of it, two things you can mean. I think what you mean by it is, just saying that to the person, well, you could talk yourself, you talk yourself into it, you can talk yourself out, out of it. There's a Yiddish expression, that's what my mother used to say. One talks oneself into it uh, is, is, is what it means. That's not gonna work. Haven't seen any data. Well, I have seen data. The, the lack of improvement on, on the, um, Waitlist, but that's not the same as waitlist. So my guess is that's not going to work, unless you find way, some way to really convince the person that they are able to do it and give them some ways of doing that. And that, of course, is likely to work as well as antidepressant medication. And that's called cognitive therapy for depression. Yeah. I mean, I would add that when people are talking Yes, and also you, you, you may be doing things like looking some, at some assumptions you have, looking at the way um, you, you are responding to some of the stressors in your life, learning some coping skills that can help you more adaptively cope with it. And that brings me to, actually, let me just mention this. If you all know this already, just tell me, we know this, we know this. How many of you are familiar with the whole uh, bereavement exclusion in DSM-5? Okay, you don't need me to talk about that, right? It's one of, one of the things I find. I guess what I meant was not literally talking yourself out of it. What I was asking is if you think this is going to be a patient of the research, is that something that you would want to say to the pressure is not really a disease mm -hmm. that can be cured with medicine or that can be treated with medicine? Okay, boy, that... That statement, depression is not really a disease, that can be treated with medicine, has two parts of it, and we need to dissociate those two parts. First, is depression a disease? If there is a disease, a phys physical disease, a malfunction that is creating depression, We don't know it yet, if there is. I mean, there may be. There may be like the, the way syphilis uh, was found to cause what otherwise might be diagnosed as a mental disorder. And there might be something similar leading to some cases uh, of depression. Certainly, certainly, depression is a normal, a normal response to many life situations. That would bring me back to the bereavement 
exclusion. And what is it, two weeks? You have a child, your child has died. You're going to be depressed. Two weeks go by. Still depressed? You're suffering from a mental disease called major depressive disorder, which needs to be treated with, uh, uh, chemically because, after all, it's an illness like any other illness, and it's a physical illness. It's a brain illness. One could argue that any parent who is not depressed two weeks after their child has passed away is in need of, they're not diseased, they're in need of something anyway. <laughs> um, so I got, that, I got to my, one of my pet peeves uh, after all. Second thing is there are things that are not diseases that one takes medications for, right? I mean, if I take a hammer and I go bang on your finger, it's going to hurt. That's not because you're a sick person. That's the normal reaction to being hit. And indeed, you're going to need some medical treatment or could benefit from some medical treatment, nothing else, to deal with the pain while the finger is, is, is healing up. You're distressed. You're distressed because you've lost a job. You've lost your pet that means so much to you. You can't afford a house. All of these things are things that lead to depression. You get sad. Should you treat it with an antidepressant? Well, I've given my answer of why I don't think you should. If antidepressants are to be used at all, they should be only used in very severe cases of depression. Not only very severe, but the extreme end of very severe de depression. And then only after you've tried other less invasive, invasive less potentially damaging treatments that have not worked. That's my opinion, anyway. Uh, aside from the issue of whether uh, antidepressants are effective, do you think they might have uh, caused qualitative changes in behavior, such as perhaps being less lethargic and more inappropriate in behavior, or any other kinds of uh, systematic changes in behavior? Yeah, I, I'm trying to remember now some of the data on what happens if you just give someone an antidepressant and the behavioral and mood changes uh, that it makes. And uh, Joanna Moncrief has written extensively about that, and I'm going to beg off on answering that because I'm too afraid of that. If I rely on my memory on it, I, I, will, I might get it right, but I'm, there's too much of a chance that I might get it um, wrong. It's an excellent question. Yeah? Um, I had a question. So if you're taking something like Christique, um, which has blown up, sorry, I can move up That's, there. Yeah, yeah, wait. This. Yeah, come on, come up and, 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 and. <laughs> can we get this mic on? There we go. Why don't we do that? Good. So if you were taking something like Christique or Venlafaxine that has like a well-known withdrawal symptom problem and you were in a placebo trial, would the people on the placebo experience the same withdrawal symptoms as um, the people taking the actual drug? Yeah, to a much lesser degree. So if they knew? Both, both the side effect profile and the withdrawal uh, uh, likelihood is very, very low uh, with placebo. And it's not just uh, Venlafaxine that has uh, withdrawal problems, all the SSRIs, right. and, and serotonin um, affecting, so the SNRIs and SSRIs uh, uh, can lead to withdrawal syndrome. You had it? Um, I was wondering, in the very beginning, you mentioned um, <laughs> yeah. something about something that was happening in the same um, I know of only one study on the use of hypnosis. I know two studies on the use of hypnosis with depressed patients. One is a study, if I recall correctly, that uh, looks at CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, with and without hypnosis, and so shows a small incremental benefit for doing it uh, using hypnosis as an adjunct uh, treatment. 
The other I know is a feasibility study again. It's actually a fascinating one because one of the th things that people say and, 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 and ask is, oh, but you know, is the patient going to be willing to do anything but take a pill? Will they go for therapy? Well, you saw the data on therapy, the three out of four will prefer therapy. And this is actually very similar. These were patients who were uh, given a choice of getting an antidepressant, depressed patients in England, uh, or getting a uh, self-help CD program based on cognitive behavioral and hypnotic principles. So it included self-hypnosis training and having occasional visits with a mental health worker who um, would see how the things are going, are there any problems, and, and, and so on. 80% chose the CD self-help hypnosis program. Um, and so many of them, and they got what they chose. Only four patients made no choice, and they were randomized. And that made the comparison, you get a comparison, you, got, did, you have patients doing better on the self-help program than they do on, did on the, uh, uh, on the medication. But, but the number of subjects, the number of patients who were on the medication was so small that even though it turned out to be significant, you'd have to do a real study to, to know. So there's some potential. There's some potential. See, here's the problem. There are a lot of things, mindfulness, meditation, other things. Mindfulness, we know, as a component, seems to be useful as part of packages that in, in, include uh, uh, cognitive behavioral approaches. But there are a whole bunch of other things that might work. They might just be eliciting a placebo effect. We don't know. Uh, for some of them, like psychotherapy, the concept of placebo is irrelevant, and if, that, if you, you want, I'll, I'll address that if anyone asks or later. Um, but there isn't a lot of funding to test them because they're not patentable, and who's going to put up the money? So what we as a society need to find a way to do, and I don't know what the answer is as to how we're going to do it, but we need to find a way to test alternate treatments of depression to be able to pit them against drugs that may be producing some of a, somewhat of a effect or may not, but have a lot of potentials for harm that the alternatives don't. We just need more data, and we need to find some way of financing. Uh, Would you like to take one more question? Sure. One more question. Yes. Um, is there any research that's been done on the mechanism of placebo? Uh, you mentioned at the beginning of the talk talking about depression drew you in because of hopelessness, so maybe placebo would give hope. Is there any work that's looked at? Yes, there is. And here's the answer to that. The, the um, Biological mechanisms underlying the placebo effect depending on what it's, depends on what it is a placebo for. Or associated, I won't say underlying necessarily, it's associated with it. So for example, there's a great study, a series of studies done by Helen Mayberg on depression in which she looked at, um, uh, she did MRI studies looking at patients who had been depressed and were treated with either paroxetine or placebo. And she got some significant differences in patterns of brain activation as a, in responders than she did in non-responders. Pretty much the same pattern, whether they were responding to paroxetine or placebo. Now, I said associated with rather than mechanism, because what they might be telling you is that Here's our areas of the brain that are more or less active depending on whether you're depressed or not. So it may not have anything to do with either placebo or antidepressant, except in that you've somehow gotten a, a, a change in, in depression. Um, we and others are, have and are doing studies looking at what's associated with uh, placebo response to, to um, uh, pain analgesics, both to pill analgesics and 
sham acupuncture where you use acupuncture needles that don't pierce the skin. Instead, the needle retracts into the shaft like a stage uh, dagger. Um, we know, and it's very complicated. It's very complicated. So we know from naloxone challenge that naloxone is an opiate antagonist. One of the hypotheses is that pain reduction with placebo pain reduction is um, associated with uh, an enhanced uh, release of endorphins, which are endogenous opiates. Evidence for that consists of the fact that if you give people naloxone, you can cut the placebo in half. You diminish it or knock it out altogether. But that's true if the placebo is a placebo opiate. If the placebo is a placebo non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, naloxone does not cut it out. But uh, that seems to be mediated by I always stumble on the word cannabinoid uh, receptors. So, so it depends on the condition you're treating and also what it's been associated with and what you think you're getting and what you're expecting to get. So it's a complex thing. It's a, wide, a lovely area for research, and I'm happy to be a small part of it. Thank you very much for your... Attention to your warm reception. Thank you.